I did ask for a box, but they didn't have one. <laughs> okay. So I'm a, I'm a feminist fisheries scientist, and if you don't know what that is, I've got good news. I've got 15 minutes to tell you. So I'm gonna start with a story. So shortly, a few months after I finished my PhD, um, the best thing happened. I was hired by Worldfish for two weeks um, to go to Bangladesh, and I was supposed to do a gender um, assessment of their new project, Ecofish. Um, I was super excited. They flew me in. This was my first big job. Um, and we went and visited a bunch of villages. And in every village, we met with the entire village. And by the entire village, it was the entire village. And so uh, they would sit, the row of, uh, there would be a row of PhDs in the middle um, on chairs facing um, part of the village. And then the entire group would surround us. And what we'd, we would end up facing is the men. And on the periphery was the women, because in this area of Bangladesh, men and women didn't sit together in public meetings. And so after a few meetings like this, I mumbled with my other PhDs and said, OK, before the meeting starts, um, let's just shift our chairs 90 degrees. And all of a sudden, instead of just facing the men, we were facing 50% men and 50% women. And this is, uh, in a nugget, what gender studies is about, shifting our perspective 90 degrees. And what does this do? What does this bring to fishery science? OK. So before I go into that, I think it's time I think you're old enough, it's time for the sex talk. <laughs> um, sex is the biological and physiological characteristics of, uh, that define uh, male and female animals. Um, these are things like chromosomes, hormones, etc. cetera. Um, and as biologists, we actually know that it's more diverse than that. Uh, we tend to think of this as a binary system, it's not. Um, so it's important to know uh, human diversity is beautiful and wonderful and uh, it's there. Um, so gender is something slightly different. It is culturally and socially ascribed attributes, roles, activities, and responsibilities associated with being female and male. And one of the main differences between gender and sex is that gender changes. Gender is different over time and space. Gender is something, it's a story we tell ourselves about who we should be. Um, and so when we mix these up, it, it can lead to problems. Okay, so before I go into that, um, now that we are all gender versus sex experts. Uh, we're gonna have a little game, quiz. So in Gambia, uh, I'm, so I'm gonna posit uh, a situation and then I'm gonna ask you whether this has to do with gender or sex. So in Gambia, women prefer to plant vegetables um, and men prefer to plant fruit orchards. Please raise your hand if you think this is a, a factor of sex. Raise your hand if you think it's gender. Thank you, okay. Now, in Germany, 90% of infants were breastfed by women. 0% of infants were breastfed by men. How many people think that's sex? Okay. Gender, anybody? Anybody? Okay, great. So now you are truly all experts. You've been tested. Fantastic, we can move on. Um, so even experts can still get this uh, mixed up, especially in biology, um, especially fisheries. So. I, I've identified what I think is a, a type one error, so that's seeing gender when it's not there. This is more, more of a semantic issue. So the effects of gender, size, and life cycle stage on the chemical composition of the smooth hound shark. Um, behavioral ecologists are amazing, but I don't think they've yet figured out how to study gender in the smooth hound shark. So <laughs> this person was actually talking about sex differences, not gender differences. Okay. The other perhaps more pernicious issue is when we mean gender, but base it in sex. Um, so for example, when we were told in the Philippines, well, women can't fish because their butts float. Um, this is not actually true. There are, so they were, they were talking about diving fisheries, and of course, there are many fabulous examples of uh, women diving to amazing depths. So this isn't actually true. But the process of mixing, of, of talking about uh, saying it's sex when it's actually gender is what we call naturalization. And what this does is we're pretending um, that the social systems where we, the stories we tell ourselves about what men should do and what women should do is in fact biological and unchangeable when that's not actually true. Okay. And finally, um, in this introduction, uh, when you talk to gender specialists, they will try and convince you in very strong terms that gender studies is not just about women. 
we are not studying women. Um, it's about something bigger. And then they will proceed to have an entire talk, which I'm about to do, about women. Why is it about, why do we keep talking about women if it's not just about women? Well, it's because women are the ones that are being left out of this equation. Um, if you're trying to compare two things and one of those things uh, you just don't have the data for, you tend to start focusing on the one thing you don't have data for. So um, gender uh, focuses on women as an, as an attempt to catch up in many cases. Um, so now that I've established uh, gender, I'm gonna talk more about uh, how feminism can help with this situation, with this lack of data. Um, so feminism can do three main things for fishery science. First, it can help reframe our research. It can improve how we ask our questions or our methodology. And it can, once we do that, it can also change our understanding of fisheries and how we decide to manage them. Um, before I go into that, uh, a lot of people sort of uh, are a little nervous when I call myself a feminist fishery scientist because feminism and science hasn't always gotten along. Um, science gets a bit nervous around ideologies. They point to feminists and say, well, you, are, you have an agenda, equal rights. Um, feminists, therefore, <laughs> cannot be objective. If you have an agenda, you cannot be objective. Um, and to which feminists uh, reply, well, you can't either with knobs on. Um, and so to feminism, to feminists, uh, who you are, your background, what you bring to your research is important. And it shapes your research. It shapes the questions we ask. And so it's important to acknowledge that. And by bringing that understanding into the larger scientific um, process, we can get to what uh, Harding talked about, which is envisioning a truly emancipatory knowledge seeking. So acknowledging, being much better at acknowledging our biases and moving forward. Okay. So let's talk about how feminis feminism can uh, reframe our research. Basically, this is a question of figuring out who is missing from our data frames. Uh, sorry, from our data. Um, feminists are really good at pointing out that women are missing. Now, it's a really exciting time to be doing gender work in fisheries because fisheries is in fact shifting its frame rather significantly. Uh, we are going from just focusing on commercially important species out in, um, to actually looking at how humans are part of the marine ecosystem. And as soon as you bring in humans into the equation, you bring in gender. Um, and so gender is a cross-cutting issue um, and so this is just one way to look at the, the broader, more holistic view. Um, some people call it the socio-ecological system. Some people call it ecosystem uh, fisheries-based management. Um, whatever you call it, it it's, it's the idea that humans are part of the marine ecosystem and that that's uh, important to consider. So you can see my little addendum there. Uh, gender is everywhere. Gender is in the middle of this. It's, um, but it's only there if you look for it. So why is it missing? Um, part of it is the language we use. So in, the, in English, we, when we talk about fisheries, it's often translated and understood uh, as meaning men's fishing. And oftentimes we think of it as commercial fishing, large scale fishing. We miss small scale fishing. We miss uh, many things um, when we don't define it properly. So when we're talking about men's fishing in small scale, situations, uh, what we're often thinking about is maybe people in boats, um, maybe somebody diving using nets, hooks, a trap. Um, but one thing, that, uh, one thing that we are missing is that woman gleaning in the shore, in the intertidal zone. Um, uh, this is often not considered part of fishing, even though it is people taking marine animals out of a marine ecosystem. Okay, so it's not just, uh, but also, it's, so it's not just how we define fishing, it's also how we define the people who fish. So in 2013, I believe, uh, Trevor Branch from University of Washington started a Twitter war um, by asking whether we should be calling people who fish fishermen or fishers. And the upshot was that uh, feminist sociolinguists uh, dislike gender language. We don't like being left out. Um, so when you say fishermen, there's an inherent assumption that the people you're talking about are men. Um, but biologists dislike synonyms. 
So in North America, there's an animal called a fisher, and apparently it has very strong sexual dimorphism and eats porcupines. Um, and oftentimes I would run into um, f both men and women who fished, disliked being called a fisher. Um, it was part, they felt it was a feminization of the word, um, and essentially it boiled down to they felt like they were being told they fish like a girl. Um, and the fact that we live in a, uh, the society we do, fishing like a girl is an insult. So um, this is, so the language is, is all very interesting. So what Trevor did is he, um, he actually went to the literature. So among academics, we are actually moving towards gender neutral language. And we found um, that this is largely due to uh, um, senior female academics um, holding editors of journals to account. So this is where the change is coming from. Um, so that uh, it's editors of journals who are changing uh, the language from fishermen to fishers. Um, so, but it's also important to note that one of the other things we did was we uh, translated the words fisher, fisherman, and fisherwoman into many different languages. And there are languages where it is completely gender neutral. So in Cebuano, where I was for my research, uh, fisherman is mananagat. Um, but the, even if it's gender neutral, within that cultural context, mananagat is still assumed to be done by men. So gender neutral doesn't equal neutrality. Um, so the second thing uh, feminism can do is improve how we ask questions. So how do we count the people that are hard to count? Um, there are many reasons why there's missing data. Here's a few that I've identified in fisheries. So first is the circular logic to not collecting data. So it goes something like this. We know that women don't fish, therefore why should we collect data on women fishing? How do we know that women don't fish while there's no data on women fishing? It's very frustrating, um, but that's changing. Uh, the second thing that happens is gender blind data, so we just don't collect gender as a variable. Um, and so you may have a, a beautiful sample of, of information, um, but you don't know whether it's men or women doing it, and so there's no way to distinguish. Um, other more pernicious things are bias sampling um, that leave out either gleaning or invertebrate fisheries. Uh, they also often tend to leave out part-time fisheries, of which men, women are, are more frequently um, to be. And uh, also, they leave out processors and marketers. So in many societies where women don't participate directly in fishing, um, they will participate heavily in the processing or marketing, and so are a really important part of the larger fisheries. There's also another interesting thing that happens which is called gender evaporation, so projects that uh, start with the intention of including women and men, um, but they don't have any gender expertise, they don't have anybody who knows actually how to do this, and so over the course of the project, women tend to get left out. So people stop collecting data on women. Um, people stop including them in community meetings because it's hard to do. And, um, and so Harrison described this as uh, evaporation. Um, radical feminists in Australia call this phallic drift. So it's the inexorable <laughs> shift towards the male point of view. Yeah. I've seen this happen. Yeah. You're awake. I like it. OK. So. I've made a list of things you can do um, to include feminism in your fishery science. So the first is, seems fairly obvious, talk to women and men. Um, so one of my favorite quotes for this was uh, uh, doing some research in, the north, in northern Canada. Uh, one Tyrell found that um, according to men, Fishing for char was predominantly men's work, but according to women, it was predominantly women's work. So you can see if you were just talking to people to understand the fisheries, if you just talk to men or just talk to women, you would get a wildly different understanding. Talk to women and men. Um, to be able to do that in many situations, another important thing you have to do is hire women and men. So an example from Nigeria, it was found that women preferred training by female extension officers, or agents, I should say. Um, in many developing country situations, uh, extension officers or agents are more likely to be male, and so women get left out because uh, in these cultural situations, it's not appropriate for men to talk to women they're not related to, and vice versa. Um, so hire women and men. Um, and also, th that has a another added effect of when you hire women and men, um, you are adding, uh, you're building 
capacity for women and men within that society to do this research. Okay. And finally, uh, not finally, um, also do gender training. This helps uh, stop evap gender evaporation. And ask about all fishing methods. I talked about that before. Uh, make sure you know what the words are. And um, this one's kind of important. So randomly select your respondents. Um, don't just go to the dock and collect all the commercial fishing that's coming in. Um, a lot of the fishing that uh, doesn't get counted is the subsistence fisheries, and those don't go through those commercial areas. So finally, um, I'm going to talk about how this changes our understanding of fisheries. Um, so what happens when you add in 50% of the population? Um, first of all, I found that women fish all over the world. Um, this was me collecting sort of information from papers, uh, if, you, if there's a dot there that's, or if, if you know of a dot that I should put on that map, please come see me. Um, the one thing that's missing is data. So there's often described, uh, they often describe that women fish in these areas, but they don't actually collect data on it. Um, so what I decided to do for my PhD was collect data on it. And I did this in Northern Bohol, in the central Philippines. Um, so I went to 12 communities and uh, with the help um, of my four research assistants, we interviewed over 600 people, men and women. Um, and what we found is that women fish quite a bit. They were responsible for about a quarter of uh, all the take that came out of the water. And uh, they also fish for food. Whoops. What happened there? Okay. So, um, and if you look at only subsistence catch, uh, women were responsible for about one-fifth of that. Um, and, but it, it, it's a bit more complicated than that. So this catch was done by gleaning, and gleaning is often done um, as uh, a last, not a last resort, but often um, when there's no money or if, it's, if uh, other types of fishing are unavailable. And it's often uh, considered very important to food security. Women also fish different animals. Um, so they're exploiting different habitats and fishing for uh, different species. They focus uh, primarily on sessile uh, macroinvertebrates, um, whereas men tend to favor uh, fish and crabs. And uh, it's also important, gender is also important to understanding the dynamics of community-based fisheries management. In this area, that was done largely through no-take MPAs. Uh, Gary Russ described the system very well yesterday. Um, so what I found was that while women didn't, uh, were less frequently um, described uh, the marine protected areas having a positive impact on their fishing, they were equally likely to recommend an MPA to another community. Um, and while they attended MPA meetings uh, at similar rates to men, um, they were less likely to actively participate. So they were less likely to be uh, participating in, in monitoring the boundaries, in, um, in going to other communities. Um, and so what we found is that uh, MPAs were largely seen as being for men's fisheries, and the decisions were therefore the responsibility of men. So moving on, um, this is just getting started. So I am just starting a, a new PhD. A oh, new PhD. <laughs> I did the PhD. I'm doing a postdoc, um, and I'm really excited. Uh, so um, recently, in the last few years. Uh, the voluntary guidelines uh, for small-scale fisheries came out, and um, unprecedentedly, they, they included gender equity as one of their main goals of uh, managing small-scale fisheries. Um, and so that gives us uh, a great deal to, to work with in the, moving forward in the future. Um, so I would like to thank all the wonderful people who helped me with my research and open up for questions.